Okay. So, <clears throat> we are continuing in Ezekiel. And so as we had, as we had uh, studied before the break, we see that there is measurements being given to Ezekiel. He was taken to a high mountain and he was shown measurements. He was shown city and, and everything was being measured. The temple was being measured. Every aspect of the temple plus the wall around the temple of the city. Everything was being measured. Oh, by the way, I, I just want you all to know, uh, anyone listening, what I found out, and this was a while ago. I don't think I've ever mentioned it to you, though. The length of a cubit in our common language today is 18 inches. So it's about an, a foot and a half is a cubit. It's 18 inches. It's about half a yard. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little less than half of a meter. Yeah, a cubit's about a foot and a half. It's about 18 inches. So when you see cubits, just think of 1.5 feet or 18 inches and you could see um, what size of whatever it is that's being measured is being measured. So if something is five cubits, that means it's about seven and a half feet uh, in length, if it's five cubits, or about 90 inches, okay, if something is, is five cubits. And so a cubit is about a foot and a half. That's about a cubit, okay? <clears throat> Just to let you all know, so if you're reading um, these things in Ezekiel, you see, you'll see that a lot. Uh, so let, let's begin in Ezekiel again, where we left off in chapter 40. And remember now, a man or an angel that's the color of brass, an angel that's the color of brass is showing Ezekiel these things. It's not the first time we see somebody that is being described as the color of brass. And then, of course, Messiah it's described as the color of brass as if it were burned in a furnace. Okay? So it's not the first time we see that. Apparently that's the color of people or beings in the heavenly courts. The color of brass is their color. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 40. And now um, in chapter 40, at this stage, at the end of chapter 40... He's being shown the temple, the inner measurements of the temple. And let's take a look at from verse 45, from verse 45 down to verse 49. Ezekiel chapter 40 from verse 45 to verse 49. And he said unto me, this chamber whose prospect is toward the south is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the house. And the chamber whose prospect is toward the north is for the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. These are the sons of Sadak, among the sons of Lawai, which come near to Yahweh to minister unto him. So he measured the court an hundred cubits long. Okay, that's about 1,500 feet. And a and hundred cubits broad and four square. And the altar was before the house. And he brought me to the porch of the house and measured each post of the porch, five cubits on this side and five cubits on that side. And the breadth of the gate was three cubits on this side and three cubits on that side. And the length of the porch was 20 cubits and the breadth 11 cubits. And he brought me by the steps whereby they went up to it and were pillars by the posts. One on this side, another on that side. So now he's measuring the temple and the things of the temple. And he's showing them and he's telling them that this part of the temple is for Zadok. Now the word Zad, it says Zadok. But if you look that word up in the Hebrew, it's the same word Sadak, which means righteousness. Okay. Sadak is of the children of the Y that... Um, that was a famous priest in Israel, and he was a faithful priest in Israel. And in, back in the time of uh, the early Israelites, he was a faithful priest. And with David, he was a priest with David. And 
That's who, and it's his children that are going to be ministers in the inner workings of the temple, of the altar. That is the sacrifice of the altar and the presentation of incense and such. The children of Zadak. And it's not any coincidence that his name is Sadak, which means righteousness. <laughs> so the sons of righteousness will, will minister at the altar of the temple. Praise the Most High. Yeah. And again, that's no coincidence, of course, that uh, he says in Malachi. This is real quick. We're going to come back to Ezekiel in a second. But let's look at Malachi real quick with regard to Sadak. Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, and talking about Messiah and what he's going to do for his people. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Notice what it says. This is a prophecy, of course. Malachi, a prophet. Malachi, Malachi, the prophet. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And Yahweh, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith Yahweh of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Lawai, and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto Yahweh. An offering in Sadak. All right? Righteousness. An offering in Sadak. And so our offering in righteousness. And so the messenger of the covenant or the angel of the covenant is Messiah. And he's going to come. And the question is asked, who may abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appears? Now let me ask you all this question. When you hear those words, when you see those two questions, who may abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth. Where else in the Bible do you hear that question? Do you read that question being asked about the return of Messiah? Where do you, that, that that's right, it's in the book of Revelation, exactly. And he, and he answers the question, he says he's going to be as a refiner's fire and like a full of soap. He's going to be a refiner and purifier of silver of the sons of the Lord, that they may offer an offering in righteousness. And again, let's look at where we see that. Revelation chapter 6. And going into Revelation chapter 7, Revelation chapter 6, and Revelation chapter 7. And of course, it's no coincidence that this is tied to the 144,000. Notice again, Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to begin at verse 15. Well, let me, let me, I gotta read, I gotta read this whole thing. So from verse, from verse 12 of Revelation chapter 6, all the way into chapter 7, verse 4. Okay, so Revelation 6, 12 into Revelation 7, 4. Notice what it says. This is the sixth seal. And I beheld, and when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the earth departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens of the rocks and of the mountains. And said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There's that question again. 
So again, it was kind of answered in Malachi. He said, I'm going to refine the servants, the children of Lawai. I'm going to refine them. I'm going to try them that they can be prepared to offer an offering in righteousness. But let's continue. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living Most High. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our Most High in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed in hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So, all of this ties together. So, Ezekiel is being shown measurements of the temple. As we have stated earlier, it is the desire of the Most High to dwell among his people. In order to do that, his people have to overcome and be cleansed from all sin. They have to overcome and be cleansed from all sin. And they have to be covered in righteousness and holiness. Okay? And that aspect of them is done with the cooperation, with them cooperating with the Father. He is working in us. He is preparing us to be able to stand in his presence. And as he did with Moses... And as he did with Solomon, and so he's doing here with Ezekiel, at each stage, he is trying to illustrate to the people that what he, in, what he inspects, what he expects in terms of righteousness and holiness and truth. And in each stage, brothers and sisters, you will notice when Moses came down from the mountain after he had received these instructions, the Bible says that his face shone, his face glowed. It was on light on it so much so that the children of Israel were afraid to look on him. Right? And it was why? Because he had been in the presence of the Father and he was now filled with the Father's Spirit. So much so that the Father told Moses, get 70 elders of all the tribes and I'm going to take the Spirit I put on you and I'm going to put it on them. Okay? And we already read. We bore witness. We read in, in, in uh, Second Chronicles where... After Solomon prayed his prayer of repentance and of uh, praise to the Most High, that the, the, the fire came down from the sky out of heaven and lit the altar of the sacrifice in the temple that Solomon had built and the smoke from the glory of the Most High filled the temple and, and, and they all bowed their faces, the Bible says, to the pavement and they said, Amen, amen for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Okay? So he is intending to illustrate to us, to dwell in his presence, he wants us to be reflective of his own holiness, of his own righteousness. And how, which we already read in Ezekiel 36, he is working by cleansing us through Messiah, cleansing us from all our sin, and covering us through Messiah in his own righteousness. That's why the scripture says, he that is Messiah became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of Yahweh in Messiah. That's the whole point. Okay? So the Father's Spirit is the key in causing us to be ready to stand in His presence. And our surrender to the Father in the Spirit and His Word, in both prayer and repentance, is also the key for us receiving that Spirit. Okay? So it's no coincidence, we're looking at Ezekiel, he's telling him the sons of Sadak, who was an actual man, that was, that, that was a priest at David's time. He said, the sons of Sadak, or the sons of righteousness, are going to minister to me at the altar. It's no coincidence that he said, the Messiah is going to cause us to go through fire and be purified, that we can offer an offering in righteousness. And it's no coincidence that... The scripture says at the end, who shall be able to stand when people and Gentiles and heathen and unrepentant, unrepentant he Hebrews are running from the Messiah at his coming. He's going to have the 144,000 prepared to have been able to stand. 
through the time of Jacob's trouble that's now getting ready to start on the earth as I'm speaking to you. Again, prophecy is preparation for the chosen people. Prophecy is preparation for the servants of the Most High. Okay? It's not preparation for the heathen because they don't believe in the Most High. They following white Jesus, Allah, and Judaism. They following the fat Buddha and Hinduism. Okay, They're not following the true God. There's only one true God. And he said, I have chosen the children of Jacob as the most, as above all the people of the earth, I've chosen them. So there's just one God. All the gods of the nations, the Bible says, are idols. Yahweh made the heavens. I'm just going by what the scriptures say. I'm not trying to start a fight with nobody's religion. Everybody's allowed to believe as they want to. That's their business. I'm just talking to the true Israelites here. The people that are grafted in among us and those of us of the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said he has chosen us above all the people of the earth. And our fathers sinned against him, which is why he's been so hard on us. He hasn't forgotten any of the promises he's given to our fathers. He has not reneged on them. He has not forgotten them. And his word is going to come to pass. He's going to end up dwelling among us. And those of us that are prepared are going to end up dwelling with him. Praise the Most High. Okay. Now, let's go back to Ezekiel. Now, we saw chapter 40. Chap and chapter 41 and 42 continue in the measurements of the court, the measurements of the, the temple, the measurements of the city continues. So let's go down to chapter 43 where actually the, Mos the Most High is speaking again to the prophet as he's showing him these things. He's giving him a, a message. And let's go Ezekiel chapter 43. Going to begin at verse 1, Ezekiel 43, verse 1, and we're going to read down to verse 10. Watch this now. Remember now, watch for the word pattern. <laughs> watch this. He's going to say it again. Notice again. Afterward, he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, and behold, the glory of the Most High of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters. You've seen this before, this noise of many waters, right? Think about where you've read that before. His voice was like the noise of many waters. You've seen that before. And the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. That was Ezekiel's back in Ezekiel chapter 9. And the visions were like the visions that I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell upon my face. That was Ezekiel chapter 1. And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate whose prospect is toward the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. And I heard him speaking unto me out of the house. And the man stood, that is the, bra the brass man, stood by me. And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet, where I dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor their kings by their whoredom, nor by their carcasses of their kings in their high places, in their setting of their threshold by my threshold and their post by my post. And the wall between me and them, they have even defiled my holy name by their abominations that they have committed. Wherefore, I have consumed them in mine anger. Now, let them put away their whoredom and the carcasses of their kings far from me. And I will dwell in the midst of them. Wait, wait, watch it. And I will dwell in the midst of them forever. Right? He said that before, right? Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel that they may be ashamed of their iniquities and let them measure what? The pattern. See it? Now this is, so he, he showed it to Moses. He showed it to David who gave it to his son Solomon. Now he shows it to Ezekiel. Right? Everybody see? You see in the pattern here? You see in what's going on? And each time, each time is the Father's intent to dwell among his people forever. Each time is his intent to do that. Okay? 
each time his people have failed him. But we have already read in the book of Revelation. We have already read that at the end, he, that is the Father and Messiah, are going to get what they want. He's going to get what he wants. He's going to have his chosen people. He's going to redeem. And we read it here in Ezekiel. We read it in chapter 36, chapter 37. We read it there in chapter 38. We read it in chapter 39. He is going to have his people. He is going to redeem them. They're going to overcome all their sin. We read just now in Revelation. He's going to have his 144,000. They're going to be prepared to stand before him. Okay? And that's what we're dealing with right now. We are very blessed. We are very blessed. We are living at the time that the prophets have prophesied about many, many centuries ago. We are living at the time that they've been prophesying about. We're living at the time that the Father has been looking forward to for 6,000 years. We are living at that time. You and I are living at that time. That's why prophecy becomes very important. How, let me ask you honestly. Seriously now. Think about this. How many people do you know that understand what, we, what I just said in terms of what time it is? How many people do you know that understand what time it is? See? Why is that? Why is that? It's because this message is first given to the Israelites. This message is going to be given to the world. Everybody's going to know what time it is. Not every, most people are not going to receive it, but everybody's going to hear it. But we, remember, go not to the Gentiles, go not to the way of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Messiah is awakening his Hebrews right now. And his Hebrew people, uh, upon their awakening, are bringing forth the message you're hearing right now. They're bringing forth that message. This message is not coming by man. This is not coming as a result of man. This is coming by revelation of Messiah. As the Apostle Shaul said. He did not receive this revelation of man. But by revelation of Yahweh Shah. Okay. He's receiving. We're receiving this revelation. The awakening started. We were getting glimpses of it prior. Like we get a glimpse of it with a Nat Turner. We get a glimpse of it with a Marcus Garvey. We get a glimpse of it with a Malcolm X or even an Elijah Muhammad. We get a glimpse of it. Okay? Glimpses. Fred Hampton. You get a glimpse of it. Some of these brothers. Okay? That most of them were murdered. But now, you got a glimpse of it. I, I, I believe we got glimpses of it in the decade of the 90s. With, with the rap music. I believe the brothers was not even realizing they was giving us messages in back in the 90s. Like Tupac, Biggie. They were giving us messages. They didn't even realize it, it was part of the awakening. Um, especially brothers like um, KRS-One. They didn't realize what they were saying. But it was part of the overall awakening that was taking place. Okay, part of it. And so now... It's even now it's going to the next stage. It's going to the stage where the actual messengers. This is not now hidden in dark places. This is not hidden in secret things in music. It's now being spoken plainly. And it's going to continue. Okay, it's going to continue. You see, he said, look, tell them, stop doing, stop doing this. I'm, I'm giving you this pattern. I, I want them to do this here. Okay. Let's continue one more verse in chapter 43, verse 11. Uh, Ezekiel 43 and verse 11. Notice what it says. And if they be ashamed. See, it's, his message never changes. Did you notice that? Look at it. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done. Show them the form of the house and the fashion thereof. And the going out thereof. And the comings in thereof. And all the forms thereof. And all the ordinances thereof. And all the forms thereof. And all the laws thereof. And write it in their sight. That they may keep the whole form thereof. And all the ordinances thereof. And do them. If they what? If they be ashamed of all they have done. It's the same message he told Moses. It's the same message he told David and Solomon. It's the same message. That's why when you go to Daniel, and let's look at Daniel. 
Let's look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Then we're going to come back into Ezekiel 44. But let's go Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. And that's why when you're looking at Daniel 9, and I want you to notice again, this is Daniel 9 is a sampling of a proper way to repent. Now we saw um, earlier in the previous lesson, we saw a sampling of a heathen and that's doing proper repentance, right? And that Syrophoenician woman from Sudan, she showed the heathen, she showed the heathen the, the, the conditions of repentance. Did you remember that, right? When Messiah said to her, I didn't come for y'all. I came for the house, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she said, and then he said, it's not good for me to take the word, of, the word that, that, is, that is strictly given to the children of Israel and cast it to dogs. And she said, truth. Truth, master, son of David. Your dogs get crumbs that come from the children's table, right? And he said, woman, great is your what? Your faith. Be it unto you even as you want. So everything that was said was true. She repented. She acknowledged who he was as the son of David of the house of Israel. She acknowledged that he came to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She acknowledged that she was not among them, and she, but she still needed him. And even though he act like he didn't hear. And let me tell, let me just be honest with you, brothers and sisters. You see, the Bible says, in times of ignorance, Yahweh winks. Y'all remember that? In times of ignorance, Yahweh winks. But now he commanded all men everywhere to repent. Now, that's a principle. The Bible does that often. It gives you a, something to happen and it brings it into a principle that you that carries forward to the end of time. This is the principle. There's always, as the Bible says, the Bible says the path of the just is as the shining light, Proverbs 4.18, that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. So truth is continually advancing. Because of the fact that this earth has been in sin and in darkness, it, truth is going to continue to advance. And at, <clears throat> in every age, as truth advances, it shows like past errors that maybe we didn't understand were errors like Maybe 25 years ago, you were going to some Christian church and you didn't, maybe 10 years, and you didn't know any better. And you thought you was doing the right thing. And in your mind, you was doing the right thing. Maybe you was keeping Sunday. Maybe you was feasting on some pork or some, some pig flesh, some swine. And now you waking it up and you like, oh man, oh man, wow, I messed up. Man, I was worshiping the sun God and white Jesus and I'm eating this, this swine. Man, I messed up. I was eating that blood. Oh, my goodness. And you start to repent. You say, forgive me, Father. I, I just didn't know. But see, at the time, you weren't aware of that. You were ignorant. And now you're repenting. And this is the age in which we live. Brothers and sisters, there might have been people 100 years ago, 50 years ago, that didn't know what we know now. Like I always, I like to bring up Malcolm X as an example. Malcolm X was an intelligent man. Don't get me wrong. Very intelligent man. Extremely. But Malcolm X was ignorant of the truths that we know now. He was ignorant of the truths that we know now. Okay? He was going according to what he knew then. We know more now. So that if I was to just follow whatever Malcolm X taught and every doctrine he believed and I just followed and I became a Muslim like him, I'd be lost. I'd be lost today. Because I would be having to, I would have to cast away and ignore all the light and truth that's been given to me since. You understand? So in times of ignorance, the most high winks. But now, at the day in which we live right now, he commands all men everywhere to repent. See? You might have been okay in a Baptist church a while back. But now it's time to wake up. It's time to understand. No, no, no. Stop, you're a Hebrew. Stop swinging. Stop, stop, stop putting that swine in your mouth. You're a Hebrew. No, 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 no. You're not going to sin until Jesus comes. No, you can stop now with the power of the righteousness of the Father. Now, praise the Most High, Yah. See, now, now he's bringing more light and there's more to come. See, I, I don't even know what it is. I know there's more to come, though, because that's just the pattern of truth. It's, it's, it's what the Bible calls it. It's um, Tumim and Urim. Light and truth. Urim and Tumim. That's what was placed in the breastplate of the priest. 
Because the representation of light and truth that comes from the Father is continually advancing and growing. And we're going to learn more. Praise His name. I don't know what it is. But I just know it is though. Because that's the pattern. Praise His name. So now you can't be acting like you don't know. You don't understand. When the answer is now put, being put out in the air by the messengers of the Most High, I'm certainly not the only one. I know I'm not the only one. They're messengers all over the place. They're just not all being heard right by the same group of people. They're scattered, just like the Bible says we'd be. We're scattered all over the earth. There's messengers out here preaching the same thing you're hearing on this microphone today, though we have never met. I know that. And so people cannot hide behind ignorance. There's ignorance because you just didn't know. And then there's willful ignorance because you don't want to know. And, and the people that are willfully ignorant are going to have a problem. Because that willful ignorance is not going to save them. That willful ignorance is not going to save them. Yeah. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9. So you see in here in Daniel 9, you're getting an example of true repentance. True repentance, okay? So, first Daniel comes to an understanding. Let's, we're not going to read the whole chapter, but just certain excerpts from it. Let's look at Daniel chapter 9. I'm going to read from verse 2. I'm going to read from verse 2 down to verse 6. From 2 to 6. Okay? Daniel 9, 2 to 6. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books... The number of the years whereof the word of Yahweh came unto Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Most High Yahweh to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto Yahweh, my Most High, and made my confession and said, Master, Adani, the great and dreadful Most High, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and to all the people of the land. See? So now he is not only confessing his sin, but he's confessing the sins of his people and his fathers. This is a classic example of repentance. This is what it's about. This is the condition of receiving the Father's spirit. Notice again, let's skip down. Down to verse 20. Going to read down to verse 20, going down to verse 23, Daniel 9, 20, 23. And whilst I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of 